welcome to the today's triage chats with expert with our expert David Pamies. He's a researcher at the University of Lausanne. Um, but before we get to ask him and hear about his job, we'll first have a short introduction of our agenda. So the chat will finish at 1 p.m., starting with the brief address from Ljubova Silju, who is um, a project manager of the three R's, and we will have a short introduction of our expert, David, and you can then ask him all the questions you want about his job. And before I leave the floor to David, um, I want to encourage you all to share your questions in the chat and our expert and I will be uh, try very best to answer all the variety of questions that may emerge. So please listen attentively. And today I leave the floor now to uh, my colleague Lubov so she can tell us more about the three R's project. Hello everyone and welcome uh, on our uh, three R's career chat. Uh, the 3Rs project of the European Commission's Joint Research Centre focuses on introducing the principles of the 3Rs, replacement, reduction and refinement of animal use for scientific purposes in primary and secondary education. The, the goal of our activities is to inspire students to think critically about the science, uh, become aware of scientific progress made for future science without animal use, uh, and also build the skills to debate nuanced and complex topics such as animal testing. With learning activities of the project, uh, students also develop science literacy skills by exploring such topics as ethics in science, how the European Union is uh, protecting the welfare of laboratory animals and high-tech uh, non-animal tools tools um, that are available uh, as alternatives. So within the project we are implementing, we run like a lot of interesting activities and uh, among them we developed a massive online course for uh, teachers. We, we worked and developed uh, educational materials for primary and secondary school teachers and our lead Lead teachers are now holding uh, workshops for uh, their peers, uh, helping them to learn what is three R's and how to use the materials developed. And among other interesting activities we have are uh, career chats, which um, which is the, the current one as well. This is our third career chat and we welcome you uh, in our meeting. And during such career chats, students have opportunity to learn about um, new career paths and opportunities in science and the three R's sphere, uh, which are so much interrelated, but also different in its own ways. And how much they are different or similar, you have a chance now to explore with David and you have opportunity to ask your questions and uh, to get practical recommendations from him. So over to you, uh, Isidora and David. Thank, Thank you very, very much, much Lyubo. And we will now go to David, David uh, Pamies. He's a researcher at the University of Lausanne, and his main focus is the development of human in vitro models that could actually replace animals in science. And he is uh, especially focused in the area of neurotoxicology and drug screening. And he's also been working on tran transitional activities related to improvement of cell culture quality, open science and education on the three R's. So from now on, you can leave your messages, your questions in the chat and we'll provide an overview and best answers we can. So uh, David. Hello everyone. Um, so uh, great to have you today. Uh, can you please tell us a bit more about yourself and what do you do? Aside yes. from what I already mentioned. Uh, yes. So um, yes. So what we are trying to develop is uh, substitutes to use animals in the area of toxicology. So basically, when the chemicals, you know, when we produce uh, chemicals like paints or you know some uh, solvents or things for cleaning. When the compounds go into the market, they need to be uh, assessed uh, 
by the government and also by industry to make sure it's safe for everyone. Uh, at the moment, these tests are done in animals, uh, what I think is not so fair. So what we have been doing in the last uh, years to try to develop substitutes to this uh, test so we can remove the use of animals and use uh, cells. And we use uh, pretty potent stem cells that are human cells taking, uh, obtaining from, for example, the skin of some donors um, with, the, with the idea that in the future we'll be uh, remove all these animals that are used um, for the chemical assessment, this is specific. Oh, wow, David, that sounds super interesting. Thank you. Um, can you also tell us a bit more about how you got the idea to pursue a career path like this? What inspired you? How, mm. how did you come to toxicology and drug screening? Even? Well, uh, I always wanted to do something related with, uh, with animals. Uh, in the beginning, I want to be veterinary. Uh, but then uh, I start the career uh, on, um, and I start to see how many animals were used in toxicology. And I thought that could be something that could be interesting to, to work in and try to, you know, help society a little bit and, you know, try to not only, not only reduce the animals that obviously uh, is an ethical concern, but also to make better science so we can have human models instead of animals, because when we, assess some compounds in animals obviously are not humans so might be some differences so uh yeah i always wanted to try to do something good for society and uh, i thought that this area might be something cool to do also i think that in the last year has been a lot of a real excitement in terms of models like we have uh, induced polypotent stem cells now we have 3d culture that simulate uh, small organs in a petri dish and these type of things, uh, I don't know, make that the field is kind of uh, um, it's evolving really fast and it has a lot of, you know, excitement into make new technologies. Like that. So that's why I thought it could fit with my interest. That sounds super, super interesting. And what did you do as your bachelor? Did you start from? This area, or you develop to go into the area? Yes, I, I, I when I start, I, I start environmental science um, because, uh, in like I say, I wanted to be veterinary, but uh, unfortunately, veterinary was not in my city, and my family is really poor, so I didn't have the money to send me somewhere else. So I studied environmental science, and also I thought it was good, you know, to try to help society and stuff like that. And then in the environmental science career, they have a toxicology uh, uh, subject. And then I start with the toxicology and I start to see that I really like it. And I really like work with cells in the, in the cell culture and in the lab. And then I start moving in that direction and trying not only to work with the cells, but also try to find a way where we can actually use it in the real life. Because sometimes you work in science and then you produce something that is not possible to be used, right? So I thought toxicology was there. It's really important for society. There's some regulatory agencies trying to move forward. So I thought it was like, I, not only that you could do science, but also you could do science that can be useful for society. So that's why, but I, I, my background was in environmental science. And then I did a master in toxicology and then my PhD in toxicology. And then I moved into that direction after the, the bachelor. But then you said it's about helping society, about using toxicology as a way to help more and to use it to, to improve the situation of mm -hmm. humanity. But how did then three hours got into all of that? Yeah, well, be, but like I, like I mentioned, so because we are using a lot of animals uh, just to ensure that the products are safe for humans. And obviously, I mean, we have to take care of our society and make sure that everything is safe. But on the other side, I don't know, it's not completely right to use animals just for the safety of humans. And, and, and I think there's a lot of suffering in some of the assessments. Uh, so it's kind of combined because uh, when I was starting um, toxicology, um, 
uh, I was starting in vitro toxicology for this reason, right? So the reason for starting toxicology was more to try to develop better tools to substitute animals. So it was already connected with the three R's. And, and after that, uh, yes, everything I've been doing, I've been related with uh, replacement. So it's one of the R's. So trying to substitute these assays that are done in animals for, for humans, uh, for human cells uh, in, in vitro. So yeah, that's why from the beginning, uh, already it was uh, in that direction, try to find substitutes to, to the animal guidelines. Can you explain to us a bit more what does in vitro mean? What is mm -hmm. the entail as well? So in, in vitro, it means that is basically culture in a petri dish. So, um, for example, um, now we can take cells from the skin of, for example, myself. I can take some some skin cells, and then I can play them in a small petri dish, and I can grow them, and I can uh, uh, even make them become something else. For example, in our lab, what we do is from the skin we can do like a small tissue of brain. So like a small brains, we call them mini brains. And so you can make like a small brains and then we can test the compounds in these small brains instead of the rat brains. And because they are human cells, we are, we are thinking that will be better prediction for the human health than when you use rats. Um, but basically in vitro means that anything that is done in the lab without like the whole animal, right? So you don't have like a mouse or a rat or a monkey. You basically have just cells. It can, can be really complex or really simple. You can have just uh, cells in a plate or you can have like 3D structure with valves and tubes and try to make something more uh, complex. Oh, wow. That sounds super interesting. And um our students want to know actually what kind of animals are mostly used in your lab and how does your research and tests actually cause them harm? So luckily in my lab, we don't use any animals because we are in a lab that, like I said, trying to substitute the animals. But in my department, uh, there are many people that are using mostly uh, rodents, so mice or rat. Uh, so they use, uh, you know, mouse or rats to do the experiments. And there are several severities on the experiments, right? Some experiments that are maybe not super harmful, that are related with behavior, with food, how they like some food or other food, something like that. But some of them are really uh, painful because, for example, in some of the labs, and, and I was just talking with a colleague this morning, they introduce a needle in the brain of the of the mice to incorporate uh, like a kind of a camera. Uh, so the mice have to live with this camera in the in the head for I don't know weeks, and that creates you know pain into the animals. Um, at the moment, there is no substitute for some of the experiments, so there is no other solution. But we are hoping that in the future we will able to use uh, better models so we don't have to use the animals. But mostly rodents, I would say, in Europe in general. Um, there's some labs that use dogs and pigs. Uh, also in some really strange cases now, also non-human non, uh, primates, so monkeys. Um, but mostly, in general, most of the labs are working with rodents. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, they also want to know, do, are you using um, human stem cells in your labs, in your research? Yes, exactly. That's what we are, we are doing. We are using uh, stem cells to, so to generate this uh, tissue that I mentioned, the brain tissue, uh, or the small mini brains that we call, we use the stem cells. So basically we obtain the stem cells from different uh, donors, and then we differentiate the cells into this small tissue of brain. And that's what we use. So we, we don't need to uh, use any animal for that. Okay, thank you very much. And we have a question which is a bit more technical one. So um, can you um, tell us um, what are the other proofs that Rotenon's to toxicology is coming from in vitro experimentation and can you explain why this insect insecticide is still used on humans as well? 
and even though it's widely tested already that it's harmful. Sorry, can you mention the name of the compound? I didn't hear. Rotenone? Uh, yeah, rot rotenone. R rotenone? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's correct. Well, well the, it's always difficult. Uh, I mean, we, we are, when we are working in the Ryan society, it's not always so easy to say, um, uh, this is not say we will not use it anymore, right? Uh, because you have to evaluate the useful, if it's really something that might bring something to society or not. And in the case of the pesticides, obviously because the pesticides are trying to kill, right, the pest. And, and, and because some of, uh, some of the mechanisms to kill these uh, insects are also in the brain of humans, uh, it's also bad for humans. So most of the pesticides actually are going to be toxic for humans, right? So what we have to find a way in these cases when these compounds go into the market, what they have to find is restricted use, right? So they have to say, okay, you can use this, it's bad for you, but you can use it only if you have like protection, uh, if you do it out far away from, you know, uh, the population, the regular population that are not protected. Uh, so then you can use some compounds that are not super safe, but in a safe environment. And, and this has happened, unfortunately, in many cases. Uh, when, when, when the society find or when the scientists find a substitute, normally uh, it slowly is replaced, right? One, one compound is going away and the other one is coming. If it has not been replaced, it's because they have not found like a good replacement for this. Um, and I know so now there are some movements trying to avoid pesticides in in, in the agriculture, but uh, it's really hard because we unfortunately have uh, other animals or insects that want to eat the same that us, and uh, it's hard to fight with this. Um, so unfortunately, I think at the moment we're still in some of these compounds, but we have to kind of use them in a safety way um, that is not harmful for, for us. However, we are not sure 100% what is the actual potential of these compounds in our society? And there are many scientists trying to prove, like it was mentioned, that these compounds are bad and we should try to find substitutes. Um, I don't know if I answered the question, but I, I think I hope so. I hope that the students are also satisfied with your answer. Um, but it's super interesting, like that it's. So it's such a slow process as well. Mm -hmm. And what I would, they would also like to know is, um, can this particular compound and other uh, mycotoxins and mold, can, it, can they actually, uh, are they neurotoxic? They, can they cause uh, brain damage and mm -hmm. nerve damage like that? Yes, there are some mycotoxins that are proved to be neurotoxic also and affecting the brain. Yes. So that's why we have to be really careful to what we eat and we have to put the proper controls to make sure that, you know, the products that we use are safe for humans uh, to, to ingest. But yes, there are some cases. And is it possible to test the effects of neurotoxicity without actually using um, rats and their brains? Yes, uh, so in the like we, when I started in, in the field, uh, people were like, oh, it's impossible. We will never find a solution to substitute the animals. But because of this evolvement of the technology, and now we have better models like stem cells and also 3D cultures that we can simulate the, the tissue of the brain. Uh, now there are movements from the regulatory agency in the European Commission, for example, also OECD, that is the organism that make these guidelines in rodents. And now actually they are developing a new guideline that will use human cells instead of animals. So we are hoping that in a few years, this guideline will be approved and then we could basically substitute the use of animals for, for, for the cells in this aspect of uh, neurotoxicity and developmental neurotoxicity. We don't know and, and to what extent maybe we, can test most of the compounds in in vitro. And then if we see some evidence, we still need to do some animal experimentation. But for sure, we will reduce the amount of animals that are used at the moment. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, one, uh, some students from uh, students from Turkey 
are asking, can you tell us about some of the challenges that you face in your job? OK, so the well, in science, unfortunately, the, the biggest challenge is to get money to do your work, actually. <laughs> so, so you have to write a lot of grants, you know, to uh, and try to get some money to do your research. And sometimes that is uh, difficult. But if you are persistent, you you can able to do it. And I think the second challenge is specifically in my area because the, the grant, the money and all this is for all the areas in science. But I think in, in my area, what is linked with regulatory toxicology, so toxicology that is gonna be in the legislation. Uh, the difficulty is to convince the legislation that there are better ways to use, uh, you know, uh, to assess these compounds. Um, and it takes some time, uh, like I say, I've been, I think, uh, more than 12 years working on this. And, uh, you know, now after 12 years, starting to see the change, right? So it is hard to convince um, the population and also the the the, gover the governments to that this is something that can be uh, used. Thank you very much. but. <laughs> Now that you mentioned that you have troubles with uh, people who are making legislations, how are the legislations affecting your work? Are they creating more challenges for you, decreasing challenges? Is it helping you or how is mm -hmm. it? Uh, well, there's two, uh, the, it could be two, seen from two different aspects. Uh, obviously, legislation are limiting uh, uh, and regulating the science. And for example, now in Switzerland, they they are more strict to do experiments that are really uh, painful for the animals and so there is increasing of uh, ethical limitations so what you can do in the lab so that's a restriction for me it's not a restriction because i don't work with animals but for many of my colleague colleagues uh, they have these difficulties right so legislation is kind of what i think is good i think it's good that they can regulate the use of the animals in a certain way uh, and the the other way um if we talk about my work, I think uh, legislation um, uh, are now, it's really slow to change things, but uh, I think it slowly is moving more into what I'm working in. So we are moving more into in vitro toxicology. So actually it's giving me a lot of opportunities in my research uh, at the moment. But I guess it depends in which area of the, you know, in which side of the coin you are. If you are more into animal experimentation, legislations put in a lot of uh, restrictions. If you are more in the in vitro now, we are getting a lot of, uh, you know, um, support. So it depends what are your area of, of uh, expertise that uh, you are more in one side or on the other. And students from Turkey are also uh, interested since there are these legislation and since there are still some uh, experiments that cause harm to animals, how do we know if the company did tests on animals or not? How do we know if uh, mm -hmm. it's ethically correct to use yes. a product or a me medic? Uh, hello? Uh, in he this case. Hello? I think it cuts the communication. I couldn't hear what you asked. Ah, sorry. Uh, the we are asking how do we can know that how we can understand if a company or mm -hmm. um, pharmacology uh, company did tests on animals in order to mm -hmm. produce that certain medication or product mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. well um, by law they are uh, obliged to present a dossier to the agencies it, it depends if it's a drug or a chemical because there are two different agencies one is for drugs and one is for you know chemicals that are going to the market but they have to present a dossier with all the experiments that they have done and actually for them they have to prove that it's safe so they have to present the animal experimentation as well in the future um when the new guidelines that are based on in vitro cultures maybe they will not have to present these experiments but at the moment they are obliged and obviously they can do some experiments that you will never know but i think companies especially big ones they don't want to do that because if they found if the legislators found that they did something wrong that will cost them a lot of money because they will lose the, the, the compound that going to the market, right? So for them, it's really important to do everything really well because one mistake can destroy the company, right? So 
they are the first ones to try to do the best, uh, or, or at least what they ask for to 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 do avoid these problems. So what you're saying is that we cannot find medication and products, at least so far, that haven't been tested on animals. It's obliged to do it uh, at the moment, uh, at, at least for medication. I, I do know I work more in the chemical uh, side, not in the drugs. But from my understanding, uh, yes, most of the drugs, I would say, have been studied in animals. At least, you know, before, um, well, there are some maybe, you know, like some vaccines now, we had the case of the COVID where um, th there was uh, less less of this uh, use of animals and move more forward. And actually it was a good example that maybe we don't need so many animals to prove that a compound or, or a drug is safe. But at the moment, if in a normal situation, I would say most of the drugs use animals to, to make sure that they are okay for humans. Thank you very much for explaining that to us. And now they also want to know, uh, well, since from, well, all of the countries, I would say from all schools, uh, they want to know what is, is there a specific project that you're currently working on? And everyone is very interested in the fact that you're sitting in your lab and you have your instruments behind us. So you can maybe, if you can maybe show us something as well, uh, okay. some of the instruments you use and maybe that you use for your uh, project that you're working on now. Okay, so um, we have a few projects uh, in the lab. Um, most of them are related with toxicology. And uh, what we are trying to do is um, we have one project where um, we are in collaboration with APA, that is Environmental Protection Agency in the US. Uh, basically, they have to screen compounds that are neurotoxic or so not. Um, so, and they are using some rat cells. Uh, so they took brain from rats and then culture them in this dish and measure the neurotoxicity. So what we are doing is to do exactly the same thing that they are doing, but the, with the human mini brains. And what we want to prove if our system is as good as the system to, to test neurotoxicity. And if that's the case, we will substitute the, the, the use of this model. And uh, so it's in a collaboration with the government in the US. And hopefully uh, our model will be as good as the rat and then we will not have to kill these rats anymore. And the other project we have is related with myelin. Myelin is a substance that are produced in the brain and go around the axons on the neuro or the neurons. And um, this substance has been really difficult to culture uh, in vitro. So in animals, we can see in, in, in humans, but in cells, when we try to develop in a petri dish, it was really hard to find this myelination. But we have a model now that is in 3D, it's like a sphere. And we have seen this myelin. So what we are trying to use is uh, develop an assay that can be used for, for to see how this Compounds that are in the environment might affect this myelin that is really important for the brain. Also for some diseases like multiple sclerosis. So we are trying to make a model for multiple sclerosis in vitro so we can test different drugs to see if it works to, and it helps patients to, to improve this myelin. And about the lab, uh, my webcam cannot move so far away, uh, but uh, we have some machines here. Uh, you see? We have a machine here to extract RNA, and we have a machine here that we use to measure electrical activity. So basically, we have uh, we can put uh, our mini brains into um, into some electrodes. So there's a plate that has different electrodes, and when we put this uh, brain tissue on top, we can measure the electrical activity. Uh, actually, how the neurons are communicating. Uh, obviously, they are not thinking because it's really, you know, immature, but uh, they have some communication and we can use the activity to see if compounds are affecting uh, uh, in a bad way our cells. So basically, we can put a drug or maybe we can put some compounds that are using in the furniture and we can put it in the in these uh, wells and we can see, for example, if the electrical activity is moving constantly. When we put the compound, we see how the electrical activity is decreased. So that means that the compound is doing something bad into the brain cells. Wow, that is super interesting. 
Fortunately, I cannot take the webcam because I could say, show you the cells that we have in the in the lab. But, uh, the maybe next not... time then. <laughs> yeah, maybe next time. Thank you very much for this amazing explanation and showing us your lab a bit more. Uh, can you tell us where is your lab actually? Uh, my lab is in the University of Lausanne, so in Lausanne, Switzerland. And we are in the medical campus, so close to the hospital, because we do some interaction with the hospital. And uh, yeah, I'm in the Department of Biomedical Science, so we do things related with medicine and biology. Super cool. And um, can you tell us more about what would be the main problems when you implement the three R's when you're working with on your projects as well? Except um, for the funding, of course, but yeah. So then I think one of the problems of the three R's is um, for for many scientists, unfortunately, um, they feel that uh, it's not necessary. Like uh, when you talk with people that have been working from, with animals for 30 years, right? It's hard to tell them uh, that they saw the options and there's something that you could do better to, to study human physiology or, you know, and I think convince them that, you know, animals suffer, uh, that because they, are, they, are, they have been working so long with uh, these animals that they don't feel anymore that you know they are doing something wrong or, or they are making the animals suffer or the, the, the life of these animals matter anything. So I think it's really hard, especially for people that has been really long time working in science to convince them that they, you know, they, they have to do a better way, better science and to avoid this suffering of the animals or also to find uh, a new models that are not based on animals. And I think, you know, stem cells is something really new. So from people that has been really long time are like, oh, you know, I don't trust these cells. Uh, I'm going to use the mice that I always work in my lab. You know? So it's really hard to convince people that uh, we have to find better solutions. That is very, very true. <laughs> we, we, we experience these questions as well uh, from our side, even through the project. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, we completely agree on that. And um, can you tell us there are students from Turkey and from Greece are asking um, as well, what do you need to, no, sorry, not Turkey, from Lithuania, I apologize, are asking what do you need to study to become a specialist in animal health and uh, in three hours as well? And do you have to study new technologies or do you collaborate with specialists in the field in order to provide better alternatives or from where do you start? What do you need to study to know about animals and how you can get to developing? Mm. There's different ways because uh, triage is really uh, broad. You have uh, people working in ethics. Uh, so for that, uh, you know, you can maybe uh, study some degree related with ethics. Uh, there are other people working more into animal welfare and most of them are veterinarians because you know they have worked with animals and they know what is the best way to reduce the pain what is the best way to handle the animals these type of things uh, or if you are more into finding replacement like in vitro cultures then is it better to study something related more with like stem cells or bioengineering or, or this type of careers that are more scientific directed uh, so it depends exactly what you want to do. I mean, obviously, if you come from one, like, for example, I'm coming from bioengineering, I still do things related with the three R's in terms of education and showing, the, you know, you can always do different things. But if you want to work in ethics, it's better if you have some kind of background in this, or if you want to work in science, uh, you it's better if you have some knowledge on what you are going to do. In the end, until you start your job, basically you are not going to know 100% you know, what you have to do. But uh, to have some background in that direction is always helpful. Thank you very much for explaining this to us. It's super interesting to know that you can uh, tackle three hours from many different sides. So it's super important as well. But do you collaborate a lot with uh, other colleagues on this? Uh, yes, of course, like, for example, uh, in my, um, in the work that I'm doing with, um, with the education, uh, I collaborate with the, uh, 
European School Net and the European Commission and this, uh, this type of organization because they know better what is needed, right? Um, or if you want to work in like a specific uh, type of uh, of research, you normally will will also contact the people and and do collaboration on that on that sense. So yeah, so we always in science you always have to keep uh, your open mind and try to collaborate with with experts because you cannot know everything about everything, right? Some people in the chat was asking about the video, and I just put the one video in case someone want to watch. Thank you very much for doing so. Um, our students also want to know uh, how accurate are the these experiments that are conducted on human cells, and how do you obtain them as well? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand uh, the question. Can you repeat it? So, so first question would be, how do you get the human cells on mm -hmm. which you do your experiments? And the other question is, how accurate are your experiments that you do on these cells? Mm -hmm. So uh, the cells we normally uh, obtain them from from um, from donors. So we get some cells from from different patients or so from healthy donors, and then when we take a little bit of a skin and then we reprogram to stem cells, we can keep them in our lab forever because we can replicate these cells. So we don't need to go to the patients anymore. Uh, so it's only one second that we take the cells and then we can do it. Obviously, to 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 see how how good is your model, we have to spend a lot of time to make sure you know that we have a reproducible model. So every time you produce the model, it looks the same. It, it, it has the same properties, uh, and so you kind of internal validate your model to make sure that is good. And we have some quality controls or some tests that we do to make sure that the the model is good to to predict some some effects. And in toxicology, especially when we are trying to, for example, we want to see if our model is good to predict if compounds are affecting, uh, I don't know, uh, neuro, neuro migration. So what we do is we, because we have a lot of data in animals, we take some compounds that we know that are actually doing this effect to disrupt the mi migration. And because we know that these compounds will do it, we take some compounds that will and some compounds that won't. And then we put them blindly in the test. And then if our test is able to predict the same compounds that we're predicting animals, and, and, and also to see that no effects in the ones that are not supposed to do anything, then we can say that our model is good because can predict uh, or detect these compounds. Thank you very much. And can you tell us, can you, you said that you can program your cells to become small brains. Can you program them to become more uh, complex uh, systems like respiratory system or digestive system? And does it cost less using these cells than using animals? Mm -hmm. If we can actually program them to be more complex mm -hmm. systems. Or so, so the same way that I'm doing with the brain, there are many groups working in different organs. So there are people now doing eyes, there are some people doing liver, lung, pancreas, kidney, different structures. In and, and now it's getting better, better. So it looks every day is looking closer to what we see in vivo, right? And uh, sometimes these models are not so difficult to produce, but sometimes are really complicated because you have to have some kind of like tubes and you know as some connections, put it in a chip with plastic and stuff. And so th some of them are more complicated than others. But I think now it's a little bit maybe expensive, not as expensive as animals because animals are quite expensive, but it's still quite expensive for doing this in a regular base. But I think because it's, this is something that is growing so much in the last five years, I think the, the prices are getting lower and the, the models are getting more established and they are good, getting uh, more applications every day. And I think we are getting really good into do some of the organs, for example, liver organoids, with the well, sorry, I didn't mention, but this type of mini organs or mini tissues are called organoids. And uh, now we can get these organoids from many, many uh, organs in the body. And every, every year there's like something new. Uh, recently was someone that developed, you know, the glands that the snakes has to, to inject the, the poison. So they were able to take cells 
and develop these glands in vitro. So you have in a plate, these glands are able to produce the venom in a place. So it's getting like really into really detail and the small things uh, can be now reproduced in vitro. Oh, wow, that is super interesting. And I hope we will get to see more and more of these kind of developments for sure. Uh, our students are now asking a very interesting questions. Can you give them some tips how they can become a scientist? How at their age now they can guarantee and increase their chances to become a scientist, especially scientists in the going into triage direction. Mm -hmm. um, so the for me, I think the the, the best that you guys could do is uh, well, first you will have to choose a uh, scientific uh, uh, career in terms of you know when you have to choose between uh, social science or biological science, you have to go in the biological science. When you have to decide for a bachelor degree, you should choose a, a, a bachelor degree in, in biology or depends when there are many science, could be physics, right? So you have to choose in the area of the triage, you should choose one related with biology, veterinary, something like this. And then in, in my opinion, something that will be uh, really nice is to try to do some extra activities related with, you know, with the lab. For example, you could do some training ship in the lab. For example, European Commission has some training ship where you can go and learn the things in the lab for a year. Uh, I mean, doing your bachelor degree, you could ask a laboratory if you can go for a few hours a week so you can, you know, learn. Because in the end, it's really important that you also learn how to use the machines and how to work in a lab. And I think that will help you a lot after, because for example, when you want to do your PhD, that is after your, your master, uh, they, they are gonna be people selecting you. And I think the people will select the candidate that has more experience already because they have to teach them less, right? So if I had to choose between five students and one of them has already experience in a laboratory, I will always get this person instead of the other people because I know this person has already some knowledge in the lab. So if you can have some extra activities or ask some laboratories, and normally they are open to have, you know, people working uh, for them uh, during this uh, period, then that will help you a lot in the future, I think. Thank you very much. This is very good advice, awesome advice, but would the, the laboratories allow high school students to come and mess around their equipment? Uh, I see some. I saw some cases. Yes, I think. Uh, I think maybe um, maybe there's maybe high school maybe will be more difficult. But for sure, bachelor uh, bachelor students for sure. High school, I don't know because you know there's some safety uh, rules and you have to be 18 probably to be in the lab. Um, but it's still like for high school. High school, there's still some activities like you know the the universities. Some have some days they have like. Uh, open day in science or you know or courses for for or some kind of information day or things like that and in these uh days sometimes they have like a small courses you know like uh initiation to laboratory things like that so you can go and start looking into the microscope and check these type of things um maybe no work in a scientific laboratory yet but i think uh, at least to 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 see if you use something that you really like and with the bachelor for sure because that's what i did when i was doing my studies in my bachelor degree i asked a laboratory that was working in stem cells can i come and work for you and help a little bit and they were really open so i was lucky and i worked with them for uh, two years uh, during my bachelor and uh, then that helped me to find my phd position actually wow great advice thank you and um our students noted that it's not um, written anywhere in your career sheet that we uh, developed with you. Um, so they're asking if you would also be comfortable telling us how old are you and how long did it take you to pursue your academic path? So your uh, um, bachelor's, master's, PhD, postdocs, everything that you did so far in order to get where you are. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm 40 years old. Uh, so uh, yes, I'm pretty old for you guys, probably. And uh, I think uh, it depends where you consider. You know, I I will say that after my bachelor degree, when I start when I start my master or my PhD, 
I was already doing science, right? So it didn't took me long. It just took the bachelor degree and maybe the master, and then I was already in science. But then if you want to see, you know, until you get a permanent position or something like that, that takes more time because uh, science is really competitive. There are many good scientists and it's hard to get a permanent position. So you have to work hard, you have to do your PhD. Then after your PhD, you do a postdoc. That is a period after your PhD and then you have to, you know, keep trying. But for me, uh, it's still science, right? You're still working, you still have a salary, you still have a job even if you don't have a permanent job, but I think nowadays it's really hard to get a permanent job anyway. But, uh, you know, you just work in science and then at some point, if you are good enough, you get, uh, you know, a professorship or something like this. Um, so I think you can start science really early in, in age. You know, you finish your bachelor degree, you can already start working in a laboratory. So it's not so long. But then if you want to become a professor, then you have to keep your studies, you have to keep producing research and it takes more time, but it depends how much, because you can also go and do science in industry. You don't need to go to academic path like me that I'm in the university, but you can also go to an industry where, you know, some companies are also doing toxicologic assessment to make sure that the compounds are safe. There's also some research inside the, some of the industry. So it's also an other possibility. Thank you. I, if someone say I, I don't look like 40, thank you very much. But yes, I am. And do you, can you maybe suggest if you, of course, know um, some state universities around Europe that are very good? Well, students are ask, asking specifically about it, Italian, but if you're aware of some other uh, aside, if mm -hmm. you know Italian, perfect. But if you know other universities in Europe, that would be very good to go and have very good scientific programs. Okay, so it has, it's hard for me because uh, I was in the US for a really long time uh, in the United States of America and just moved here like uh, a few years ago. So I'm not super into all the research, but for example, I know that uh, Utrecht University has a nice program in toxicology. Karolinska Institute has also a really good program in toxicology. In here in Switzerland, ETH, that is in Zurich, is also a really good university. EPFL, uh, that is in Lausanne, is also a really good university. Uh, UK universities, uh, especially, for example, um, uh, uh, King College and these ones are, are really good. Um, so there are many good universities. I think if, if you want to actually go and see what are the best universities, in internet you can find a ranking. So if you put uh, best university rankings in, in, in Italy or best university rankings in Europe, you will see a ranking of, of all the universities in Europe. And this is evaluated by science, uh, uh, the quality of the research and stuff like that. And then you can see, okay, these are the best uh, universities and uh, that's what I want to do. But not always the best universities will go to the, the science that you want to do, right? So don't get too, you know, uh, too crazy with, I want to be in the best university in the world because sometimes you go to the best university in the world and you are in a lab that is not so great. And then, you know, it's not always ranking the most important thing. But if you are interested, there are on Google, you can search and you will see all the, all the ranks. that sometimes the best doesn't always mean completely the best exactly yes. in every way and i would like uh to ask two very important questions so first one how teachers and parents can stimulate students to and their kids to go into career like yours and how can we help integrate three hours in the curriculum that would also um, contribute to getting them more interested about these fields and careers? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think actually it's not easy to answer. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not a parent myself, so I don't know how hard it is, but I'm pretty sure it's really hard. I think uh, teachers um, has the possibility to show them uh, the excitement of science with the new advantages, uh, 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 the new things are coming out, right? Because I think uh, when I was studying um, 
in the high school also you need in in the beginning of the university you know you you show some science right but you are showing you know science that maybe was done you know 10 years ago or something like this right because science moves really fast and i know for for teachers because you are overloaded and you have to work so much that it's hard to you know keep track of all the new things that are coming but i think if you show the kids and you you find the time to show the kids the new things uh, that are coming i think it, it will bring excitement for them because it, it brings to me, right? So, and I think when I talk with people about these organoids and mini brains, people are like, wow, this is so cool. So I want to know more. And I think uh, that's the things that teach, teach it my, my give to the students also to try to find the new things and show them. And so they can see, okay, wow, this is really cool. It's not just boring, you know, kill a rat. It's also, you know, generate uh, small organs and, you know, this type of things. Uh, and and the parents can always support the kids by by bringing them to these activities that I mentioned. So maybe be aware of these open scientific days in the university, uh, and so they can bring the uh, the students to these uh, places. Or if they can do some research of some of the courses. So for example, these activities that you know uh, showing the, this type of activities uh, is always going to improve uh, uh, the hopefully the, the engagement in science. Thank you very much for telling us that. And uh, yeah, we completely agree. Some, and, but it's sometimes very hard as well for teachers to yeah, I know, yes. keep it's, track of every new invention and course, everything yes. that is happening. But for sure, I, I think I think uh, I think there are some blogs uh, on on internet or you know now even like some platforms like TikTok and things like that where some some people you know do like a summary of new discoveries uh, and then you know you can just it's not so easy difficult to you know watch in social media or follow these people and then you can say oh this is cool I'm gonna look a little bit more and then they're gonna maybe talk about my students about this uh, so then you don't need to. I mean, I'm not gonna, uh, it's, it's really crazy to ask teachers to go into, you know, literature, scientific literature, read the manuscripts, this is hard. But if you, you know, social media, see a video, okay, they are explaining about, uh, you know, mini hearts, uh, okay, or, or or they transplant a heart, pick a, a heart from a pig into human, you know, these type of things you can see in social media, and then go a little bit deeper and then explain to your students. Thank you for such a great advice. I have a last question and maybe to be a shorter one. Is there something that you wish that you had studied in your school that would better prepare you for your career now? Well, I think something that it was really hard for me when I was younger was maths. And I thought, you know, oh, I'm going to be biologist, I don't need math. And, and now that, you know, I need for uh, statistics, uh, all this, I kind of like, shit, I was oh, sorry, I didn't want to say about one. Uh, but I was like, oh, should I, should I study, you know, uh, maths more? <laughs> or, uh, yeah. So I think if you're going to do biology, don't forget that, you know, still we need the statistics and mathematics are necessary at some point. So if you can put some effort on that, I will recommend it to you. So keep it interdisciplinary all the yes, time. Yes, exactly. Yes. Don't okay, forget history, all the science. You know, try to 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 learn about all the science. Thank you very much, uh, David, about uh, to, for providing all of the answers to our questions, and uh, you, we talked a lot today about your what do you do, what your legislations are you, how their legislations are restraining you and helping you in this in your career what you do in your lab about your project, about new discoveries that your, uh, you and your colleagues have made. It's, it was all very super interesting and it, it was very interesting to hear your opinion on how we can promote it more and how we can help both teachers and students to uh, in, uh, inspire the, the, their students and their parents you know, to help them um, pursue careers in science and pursue this kind of career in three hours as well, and how three hours comes in into to the story with all the scientific no, knowledge and discoveries you've made. So thank you very much for all of that. I also want to thank all of our schools and teachers that joined today. I really hope that you learned a lot, that you enjoyed our session, that 
Um, David also answered all of your questions. We truly tried to ask everything you asked. If we did not, we apologize. Um, we can uh, we can ask our next uh, um, speaker next next week some of your questions then. And uh, I hope you have all a very nice Friday and a very nice weekend and that you learned a lot. David, if you want to say some closing remarks as well, go ahead, please. Well, thank you for inviting me to, to be here and it was a pleasure. I hope I answer. Uh, I did my best to answer the, the, the tough questions that you guys asked. And uh, I just want to say that uh, let's keep motivated for science because we have to improve many things in society. Thank you very much with such a great point. Uh, I will now uh, close this session. Thank you very much for your super active participation. Questions were really flowing and we hope to see you next week as well. And have a nice weekend. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.